There was a woman who wanted peace in the world and peace in her heart, but she was very frustrated. The world seemed to be falling apart. She would read papers and get depressed. One day, she decided to go shopping and she went into a mall and picked a store at random. She walked in and was surprised to see Jesus behind the counter. She knew it was Jesus because he looked just like the pictures she'd seen on holy cards and devotional pictures. She looked again and again at him and finally she got up her nerve and asked, excuse me, are you Jesus? I am. Do you work here? No, Jesus said, I own the store. Oh, what do you sell here? Oh, just about anything. Anything? Yeah, anything you want. What do you want? She said, I don't know. Well, Jesus said, feel free, walk up and down the aisles, make a list, see what it is you want, and then come back and we'll see what we can do for you. She did just that. Walked up and down the aisles and looked at all the options. There was peace on earth. No more war. No hunger or poverty. Peace in families. No more drugs. Harmony. Clean air. Careful use of resources. She wrote furiously. By the time she got back to the counter... She had a long list. Jesus took the list, skimmed through it, looked up at her and smiled. No problem. And then he bent down behind the counter and picked out all sorts of things, stood up and laid out the packets. She asked, what are these? Jesus replied, seed packets. This is a catalogue store. She said, you mean I don't get the finished product? No, this is a place of dreams. You come and see what it looks like and I give you the seeds. You plant the seeds. You go home and nurture them and help them grow and someone else reaps the benefits. Oh, she said. And she left the store without having anything. We can often have a negative reaction to sharing our faith in Jesus. What will they think? Will I be rejected? Will I be embarrassed? How will I respond to their questions? Does my life stack up? And we can react offensively when sharing faith seems to be against the tide or seems to sit strangely within the environment we are in, perhaps being under the perceived pressure of possible personal attack. We'd rather it be easier to share our faith. And sometimes we want others, including governing authorities, to make it easier for us. To answer the first point about any nervousness, we should be seeking to grow in such a way that we don't have to think about sharing Jesus or witnessing to Jesus because it just happens naturally as a matter of course. We are so enthralled by and committed to Jesus, it just happens If our testimony is accepted, fantastic. If our faith is rejected and we have done our best in presenting Jesus in the most favourable of lights, so be it. We are not accountable for the results, only for sowing the seeds. To answer the second point about any defensiveness, the gospel has always made greater gains in times of discomfort rather than ease in times of persecution rather than cultural acceptance. The gospel has tended to lose its edge when it comes into the mainstream. It easily becomes sanitised and the radical need for repentance and being born again gets lost. The early church was successful in sharing the gospel against the tide, as Paul points out in his letter to the Philippians. The possibilities of nervousness and defensiveness are addressed as we listen to Paul. Paul had complete victory over any fear or defeatism. 
Paul, following a radical conversion from enemy of the gospel to its chief proponent, became so transformed that his very life spoke about Jesus. And as Paul attracts opposition from those who would resist the gospel message, he continues undeterred in effectively sharing the name of Jesus. In so doing and in so being, Paul gains a lot of interest for the gospel. Paul embraces the adventure of sharing the good news about Jesus to both Jew and Gentile through whatever circumstances he finds himself in. Paul sees that each situation he is in, no matter how difficult, as a God-given opportunity to make some ground for the kingdom of God. Paul's level of faith-sharing never wavered under severe testing. It actually brought an even greater contrast to the broken ways of the world. The darker it got, the brighter Paul shone. This is why Paul never never lamented his circumstances. Paul actually saw his imprisonment in Rome as a positive. We see there in verse 12, what has happened to me has actually helped to spread the gospel. We see this happen in sometimes very unexpected ways. We shall see shortly from Acts chapter 28 that when the gospel was being spoken against in some quarters, this gave Paul all the more opportunity to speak for it. Circumstances should not be relevant. We should not let, we should not let them define us or divert us. We live for Jesus, come what may. Unless we think this too idealistic, this is how Paul went about it, as have many great Christian saints and martyrs over the centuries. It's not that you want persecution or feel superior by persecution, it's just that what comes is what comes. We should never allow nervousness or fear or defensiveness or defeatism in the door. We have the Holy Spirit. Victory will be ours in Christ. The means by which we share Jesus alter as different situations arise and methods change as God reveals them to us while the gospel remains the most powerful message of hope in the world. So we should also read through the incident likely lying behind these words in Philippians and we find that in Acts chapter 28, the last chapter of the book of Acts. When we came into Rome, Paul was allowed to live by himself with the soldier who was guarding him. Three days later, he called together the local leaders of the Jews When they had assembled, he said to them, Brothers, though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our ancestors, yet I was arrested in Jerusalem and handed over to the Romans. When they had examined me, the Romans wanted to release me because there was no reason for the death penalty in my case. But when the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to the emperor, even though I had no charge to bring against my nation. For this reason, therefore, I have asked to see you and speak with you, since it is for the sake of the hope of Israel that I am bound with this chain. They replied, We have received no letters from Judea about you, and none of the brothers coming here has reported or spoken anything evil about you. But we would like to hear from you what you think, for with regard to this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. After they had fixed a day to meet him, they came to him at his lodgings in great numbers. From morning until evening, he explained the matter to them, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. Some were convinced by what he had said, while others refused to believe. So they disagreed with each other, and as they were leaving, Paul made one further statement. He quotes from the prophet Isaiah, I won't read all through that. You can check that later. I'll go down to verse 30. He lived there for two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Due to various agenda-ridden concerns, over the direction of Paul's message and trumped up charges pending against him, Paul was placed under house arrest. 
and was closely guarded lest he step out of line, likely chained by the wrist. Paul had no freedom of movement and you could easily see the downside of this. Yet there was never a sense that Paul was worried about this perceived lack of freedom. Let's look at this another way. Paul, being restricted to home, was able to regularly receive visitors and have people coming and going interested as to why this man had caused such a stir. Why was this man's message such a threat, especially to the religious and civil ruling authorities? There would likely be curiosity and strong interest in Rome. Why this well-reasoned man was attracting such opposition to his ideas. The fact that Paul and his unique message had attracted opposition actually opened a door of opportunity. And plenty came. We see that in verse 23 on the next slide. Plenty came. Just imagine the great discussions to and fro there would have been. And many responded to the good sense and truth in Paul's words. There were people who were convinced by what he had said. At the very least, this means some wanted to know more. And at the very best, some became converts. Some were certainly now on a good path towards faith. Yes, some didn't believe, but that is always the case. The exciting thing is that there were new believers. And Paul didn't bother defending himself, nor the sect as it was known, but rather just talked about Jesus and his kingdom. No, Paul was not worried about his lack of freedom, for he sensed that he was where God wanted him to be. Paul's central concern was being faithful to the gospel. He was in chains in the service of Christ Jesus. In a way, he was in chains, but in another way, his chains had already gone, as we heard sung and sang earlier. He had been set free in a different sense. Paul was always looking for new adventures of faith. Paul was so far out of any comfort zone, no comfort zone even existed anymore. Paul was out on a limb and simply on fire for Jesus. Paul had been saved from his past religious slavery simply into a love affair with Jesus. Paul would stand with Jesus no matter what. And the faithful way in which he dealt with his unjust punishment was very impressive indeed. Paul's positive attitude to his situation spoke heaps about his relationship with Jesus. This is a lesson to us, that the sharing of the gospel should not be restricted to only when things are going well. In fact, finding authentic ways to share the gospel message under suffering is actually far more powerful than when life is easy. Yes, times can be tough, but we are seeing how God is entering our suffering and how God is gently nurturing our way forward in being effective people in his service. Old-time commentator G. Campbell Morgan talked about how adverse conditions can be the allies of our soul and ministers of victory in the hands of God. As mentioned, it is likely that Paul was chained, perhaps loosely, to a single guard who would be on a four-hour shift. Think about this another way. This guard would be chained to Paul for a four-hour period. And then another guard would take over. There would be a revolving and repeating roster of guards who would have no choice but to listen to Paul. Paul could be chained, but the gospel could not. It was actually Paul who had the captive audience. Paul may have looked forward to the return of particular guards who had shown some particular interest or had responded in certain ways. Paul may have also looked forward to the possibility of a new guard being assigned to him. And we are told that this went on for at least two years. We'll just go back to the Philippians reading, please. Paul reflects on the results of this back in Philippians chapter 1, verse 12. What has happened to me has actually helped to spread the gospel so that it has, be, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard 
and to everyone else. It seems certain that as some of the guards, Paul actually refers to the whole imperial guard, as some of the guards accepted the gospel message, it also spread through them to their wider circle and then further throughout Rome. Such was the power of all this. So many came to understand in the face of his persecution that this was far from pointless for Paul was imprisoned in the service of the Jesus of whom he spoke. And there was a further outcome. At least equally significant in verse 14. Paul's positive attitude and life orientation had served to embolden all the other Christians. Whereas other believers may naturally have become discouraged by Paul's arrest and on imprisonment, the opposite had actually happened. Just in the way the beginning of verse 12 is phrased, I want you to know, suggests that Paul was wanting to clear up a possible misunderstanding. The church in Philippi, to whom he was writing, may have had very negative feelings about the implication of Paul's imprisonment for them. They could have seen this as a major setback. Yet, that is only how it looked, not how it was. Paul was very keen to say that his imprisonment was not a reason to retreat. Quite the contrary. There was purpose to be found behind this situation. This imprisonment had not been detrimental, but rather advantageous to the gospel. Not a disaster, but a plus. The believers in Rome were on fire for Jesus. They too, following Paul's example, were confidently spreading the word. Now, over to the believers in Philippi. They could do the same. We can look at the signs and fear and defeatism can build. Or... We can be that sort of community where we embolden each other through encouragement and example in our positive life journey of living and sharing Jesus. We need to allow God's spirit to build Jesus so strongly into us that all fear of other people's contrary views disappears and any defeatism about how the world is going is silenced. This doesn't mean we become in any way insensitive to the great variety of stories out there through which there is a great struggle around issues of faith. Certainly we listen first and then we pray. But we surely also keep the lines of sharing open. This simply means we fully own who we are in our own Jesus-following life and live out that in the public gaze. Sometimes this means coping with and excelling through the opposing barbs of people who are quite close to us, even very close to us. This can be quite painful. Sometimes we have to keep following Jesus when others think we are mad. In this we should know quickly we are in good company. For many in Jesus' own family circle and in his hometown of Nazareth thought during the early stages of his ministry that he was mad. We'll just whip to the end of the Acts reading again. The book of Acts dramatically closes in this way, with this emphatic statement of the ongoing witness to Jesus. Paul spoke with boldness. How might we understand boldness? Confidently, courageously, clear, open, unobscured, thoroughly in the truth, publicly without fear of consequences. And in this, there was no hindrance, no effective obstacle. This was a winning message. The Holy Spirit was at work. 
such that no circumstances could repel the gospel as it was shared with boldness. And in a way, at the end of Acts, the ball has been passed to future generations of missionaries, which is us. Where there are letdowns, failed experiments, false hopes, broken promises and unmet expectations, everywhere, people will still respond to a positive, grace-filled, truth-filled, clear expression of good news. People are searching and will be prepared to travel on a path paved with hope, sincerity and friendship towards the greatest of discoveries. The Holy Spirit is working, opening doors, providing opportunities, blessing bold expressions of faith. Let's fully embrace the adventure, wherever it takes us, whatever the circumstances we find ourselves in. Let's embrace the adventure together. We are all part of Acts chapter 29 might have heard of a church movement calling themselves Acts 29. But we're all part of Acts 29 where this book has left off. Some believe that Luke would have written a third volume after his gospel, then Acts. Maybe so, maybe not. But this conclusion is instructive enough. And we have to say, the gospel will not be thwarted. Amen.